she's on drugs or something. so much for blessing me to be here today with uh, Jeanette Davis and I bless the other two members who wants to join us but uh, have yet to join us and I also ask you Lord to please bless Ivan Kilgore and all of his endeavors bless his books bless the work of his hands the thoughts of his mind and his heart cover him Lord and bring him out of his situation now so that he can come back out a free man and be able to share to the entire world to an even greater extent all that he has learned and done. Thank you, Lord, for this day. I praise your holy name, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, well. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Oh, cool. Hold on, let me. Oh, my goodness. The one and only. Let's give him a hand, everybody. The one and only. <laughs> The one and only in my head. <laughs> Welcome to the Hustlers Corner, my brother. <laughs> hey, man, top of the morning. How y'all doing out there, man? I'm all That's right, man. Thank, you. thank you for having me. I'm man, good, you're man. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Your book all is right. a hell of a read, bro, so far. I'm is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I surprised you with that one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Mm. As you know, uh, um, Ivan, the uh, Hustlers Corner is uh, a podcast in which we talk about things that uh, heavily affect the African-American community, and especially um, in the diaspora, especially things like what you cover in that book, which uh, I have to admit, it really, really, it, it, it's so far from what I've written. I'm just reading, I'm still on the first chapter, and from what yeah. I've read so far, already it's <laughs> I have been reading it too. Like, wow. <laughs> have you read some of it, uh, Okay. Yes, I have. It's very, very good. You know, I'm, I'm still reading it. Thank I, you. I, it took me seven years to put it together, so you're going to have to, you got to do on that for a while. <laughs> wow. bro, you, you got yeah. some material there, bro. <laughs> you well, some- you know, when, when I put it together, man, I, when I put it together, I just wanted to make sure that you know I touched all bases best I could, given the position I was in and writing. Right, it mm-hmm. was no easy feat putting that material together. I mean, you got to remember at the time I did that, I was in the maximum security prison, the super maximum security, in the shoe confined to a uh, 23 hour lockdown. You want to talk about a hard time getting a hold of research material? That's why it took me seven years because you know I had to write different universities and you know, fortunately, different agencies and stuff sent me to reports and statistics and data that I could use to, you know, shape my uh, arguments and things of that nature. Of course, I was fortunate to have a lot of brothers, good brothers over the years who shared a lot of volumes with me. I mean, I even found books in the trash, man. And it's just amazing how sometimes you can walk out in, in the chair and, you know, you got a dude who on a trash crew and he say, here, man, I found this in the trash can, you know, because a lot of these offices, they are throw away our books and stuff because they know mm-hmm. that's the one thing that keeps us going in here. You know, uh, you know who your story reminds me of, to be perfectly honest? Reminds yeah, me of that? 
it reminds me of Malcolm X. Yeah. Wow. It really wow. does. Thank you. Thank you. Spent, <laughs> That's a compliment. <laughs> I agree with you. Yes. He was like 10 years in prison, and all he did was read. And when he came, yeah. he came out the head of the Nation of Islam. That's been like a base source of inspiration for me. I remember the first time I came in contact with Malcolm X. I didn't even know who he was. I didn't know who Alex Hadley was. Uh, when you get to chapter five in the book, which is entitled The Unorthodox Teacher, I tell the story of how my southern and many school administrators uh, who were raised to the core made it a point that we didn't know nothing about black history. Mm -hmm. So years later, uh, I recall myself, I was 16 years old and I had found myself in a juvenile facility camp uh, and it was near a local college that we would do a satellite college program at. And they told us one day they'd come into the classroom uh, with copies of the autobiography of Malcolm X. And they passed mm -hmm. it out to each one of the students and told us that there was this event coming up mm -hmm. and we would be able to attend the event and speak to Alex Hayes. So I looked at the book, Alex Hayes, who? Malcolm, who? You know, 16 mm -hmm. years old, never even heard of either one of these people. <laughs> Through the through book and trash, never looked at it again for another five years when I was sitting in the county jail facing a, a first degree murder charge in Oklahoma. And that was the first time I really started opening up to the vistas of reading the story of Malcolm X. And it was just so inspiring. I think a lot of young brothers who come up in here and strive to educate themselves. That's probably one of the first books they pick up. So far out of reading your book, uh, Ivan, from what I read so far, you were born in we we hope uh, Oklahoma and we woke up. 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 Okay. You were born to uh, a father who was Cherokee, half African American. Yes. And uh, on, yes. And uh, and your mother, who, as I had said before had some pretty questionable things to food on the table. And but one of the Yeah, you know, uh when I was unfortunately when I was three years old, my father was cute. And uh that was probably one of the first life altering events that really changed the course of my life. And I say that because at that time, my father was born and raised in Bowley, Oklahoma, one of the first prominent African-American towns in the United States. Got a question for you. Have you ever heard of the 1949 Housing Act? Do you know what it did to the African-American community? How about Black Wall Street? The famous Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Do you know that there was another Black Wall Street more famous than Tulsa that existed 10 years prior to Tulsa, Oklahoma? When you see the violence escalating in the black community today, do you know of the systems that are responsible for its implementation and permeation. All of this and more is explained in the book Domestic Genocide by Ivan Kilgore. Get your copy today and learn the truth, for the truth shall set you free. And if you're enjoying the Hustle's Corner podcast, hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Share this content on your Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram feeds. Help us to grow this network. And stay tuned for more upcoming hot topics that reveal the truth of the nefarious activities of a country and its sanctions against the African American community. A lot of a lot of people always hear about like Black Black Wall Street, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, mm -hmm. Bowie's about an hour fifteen minutes from Tulsa, and it's actually the nexus of of Black progress in terms of the first Black colleges, uh, first Black uh, chartered banks in industry in the nation. 
So Tulsa. actually, they, they, they were the real Black Wall Street before Tulsa? Yes. Yes, uh, Tulsa was in the 1920s. Bowley, Bowley was founded in 19, I want to say 1901, but it was it was a, a, a result of the Dawes Act and the Fleet and the Emancipation Proclamation, where the Creek, the Creek and Cherokee uh, natives were forced to allot 160 acres to the African slaves, and so they became known as the Creek Freemen, which was my grandmothers and the Cherokees. Uh, who founded uh, uh, Bowie, Oklahoma, which was a, a white railroader named J.T. Bowie. And he gave the, op the, the opportunity to set up a railroad station. As you know, back in those times, that was big business in terms of agriculture and industry. So from that railroad post, it became a prominent spot. Uh, Bowie was going to go to become a prominent spot of the agriculture district and center and eventually established his own banks and he became notoriously known for authorizing the uh, robbery in terms of the notorious gangster pretty well floor. Many people don't know that story. It was recently on PBS they actually told that story. And uh, my father had to grew up in that culture and period of black progress. I uh, come from a family of a uh, small farmer who had worked hard to obtain land, property, and their own business. So you can imagine the impact that would have on me growing up uh, after he was killed when I was three years old. My, my grandparents actually became my rest haven in terms uh, at this time of their life, they had settled down Christian folk, uh, founders, their own church, uh, business owners. Again, that spirit that came out there, you know, went up there and woke up boldly, most black folk as entrepreneurs. And so uh, living with my grandparents, it really gave me some stability in terms of you know, people taking time to teach me things and living out there in the farm, because that's where we live mm. in the country. We lived on a 200 acre ranch. Mm. And as wow. a kid, I, could, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine having any other life. So you see, you know, that, that really, that gets me wow. so much, especially when I hear things like white people built America. But yeah, I keep hearing these stories of these towns like Chicago, LA, that was founded by black people. And yeah, but where do you hear that white people built America? Everybody knows that African Americans built America, African Americans built the White House. We all know this. Yeah, well, you know, that's 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 the sad part about our history in America. And you know, I can speak more about the value of diversity in terms of everybody benefiting from each other's culture and contribution to building this country. And see, that's why we have this lack of appreciation, particularly for African Americans, even for African Americans in our own community, uh, don't appreciate ourselves. It, yes, you know, absolutely. We don't understand how it was we contributed to our community, so we don't have no sense of uh, community pride that we understand our communities because we don't have that connection, that history, uh, and mm -hmm. knowledge of knowing that, hey, we built this. <laughs> you know and you know what I think is really sad um, I'm a high school teacher and you know what's sad is that the reason why a lot of young African Americans these days do not know the history and know the reality of building America because it's not taught in schools yes. and then if you try to teach it in schools that's when you become the nemesis and you become the problem when you try to teach yes. reality and African American yes. history in the United mm -hmm. States well, they call these cultural studies, right? And what I've seen in, in um, the K through 12 level is that's that first phase of institutionalization. And I speak about that in my book in chapter five, I go into what we call the unorthodox teaching. And what we have to understand about institutions, and I, I don't have the exact quote, but the institutions are built and maintained by people who are trying to preserve their interests. And when we yes. think about uh, when we think about education institutions, economic institutions, or criminal justice institutions, we need to think first in terms of whose interests are trying to be maintained. These institutions. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. It's mm -hmm. very clear when we look into these systems and we start studying and learning of uh, the Eurocentric roots, the, the, the history behind criminal justice system that goes back to uh, England, uh, the education system is you know, Western philosophy uh, that excludes uh, any other philosophy. So as I was recently speaking to one of our volunteers who happens to be uh, a white school teacher as well, and I informed her, I said, you know, for us to be in this world, 
Latin America, one of the most competitive and so-called greatest countries in the world, uh, we often limit ourselves by subscribing mm -hmm. Is quite high in terms of if we want to be really contenders and competitors worldwide, especially in the global world, why would we want to limit ourselves to teaching our children one language? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to teach we want to teach our children the first the, 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 every language on the continent that can get them access to uh, uh, experiencing the cultures and stuff of other uh, uh, peoples and societies. And I said, when we limit ourselves like this, then we shut off the information, we shut off the technology, we shut off the science in terms of medical and medicinal practices and things like that. And then we sit here in this world wondering why it is we're so limited in our capacity to address our issues and problems. Because we have limited ourselves to one discipline in terms of a discipline that was not designed to actually teach us and empower us, but to disempower us. This concludes part one of the Hustlers Corner podcast series with author Ivan Kilgore. Differential Association Theory and Domestic Genocide. In our next podcast, we discuss the questions, how the hell did millions of black people end up in urban housing projects across America? Why are they overrun with such high levels of ineptitude, apathy, ignorance, indifference, and violent crime? And how does the federal government itself play a huge role in this dismal predicament that black America faces? All of this and more can once again be found in Ivan Kilgore's book, domestic genocide get yours today and if you like this podcast please show your love smash that like button give us a thumbs up subscribe to our channel and share this podcast on your facebook twitter and instagram feeds help us to grow this network and get this very important information out and if you are a person that has a story to tell that's been through the prison system, that's suffered from severe conditions within the black community, and has lived to tell your tale, we will be more than interested in having you as a guest on our show. So thank you for coming to the Hustlers Corner. Looking forward to you joining us again. Peace out. Introducing the Hustlers Corner New York City $500 Visa gift card giveaway. Write guest blogs for us. Write articles for us. Leave comments. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch our videos. Make a YouTube video about the Hustlers Corner New York City. Share our content on social media. Join our growing Facebook group. Visit our shop, make a purchase, and more. All of these will gain you points towards the maximum needed to win the prize. First one to reach the maximum amount of points required wins the contest. Visit the Hustlers Corner New York City website to sign up and get started. This contest ends January 1st, 2020 at 12 midnight. If the contest date has already passed, visit the Hustlers Corner New York City website, hit the contests and promotions link in the desktop menu or the three lines underneath the Hustlers Corner banner on your smartphone for upcoming contest promotions.
This is our first contest, so it is only available in the United States. Future contests will be worldwide. Link to the Hustlers Corner New York City website in the description below. Good luck.